Uh, welcome everyone to this colloquium at the ICMM, ICMM dedicated to the Nobel Prize in Chemistry on 2020. Our speaker today is Dr. Luis Montoliu. But before introducing, introducing him properly, I would like to remind you to please keep your microphone mute. Uh, and I would like to also say that uh, if, you, if you want to make any case question, you can write it uh, on the chat. And also at the end of the presentation, you could keep uh, some more questions and, and you could do, you could do uh, directly to, to the speaker. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Montoliu for accepting our invitation to this colloquium. And uh, uh, introducing him, for introducing him, I would like to say that uh, Luis Montoliu uh, obtained his degree in, and his doctorate in biology from the University of Barcelona. And then he completes two uh, postdoctoral stay at the German Cancer Research uh, Institute in Heidelberg and at the Autonomous University of Barcelona before joining the National Center of Biotechnology uh, in Madrid in 1997, where he is currently a scientific researcher. He is also researcher and member of the steering committee of the Center of uh, Network Biomedical Research in Rare Diseases and director of the Spanish node of the European Mutant Mouse Archive since uh, 2007. And he has been an honorary professor of the Autonomous University of Madrid for 20 years. And he has received uh, several awards because uh, in addition to research, he's interested and passionate about bioethics, training, and scientific outreach. He has made relevant technological contribution to animal transgenesis, such as the use of artificial chromosome, and he has been pioneer in the introduction, use, and dissemination of the CRISPR test technique for gene editing in our country. He has published more than 124 uh, scientific articles, and he has written several books on gene editing and albinism, and he is co-inventor of several patents in, in, the field, in this field. And today he's going to take to talk uh, about the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020. Please, uh, please, uh, you can go ahead. Thank you, Conchi. Uh, good morning, everyone. So it's a pleasure for Sorry. me to be here in your colloquia. So now I think you can you, you see the, the first slide. So today I'm going to be talking about these two researchers, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Downer. And these two researchers were awarded, as you know, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2020 for developing a method for genome editing. This is a technique that we use routinely since, I would say, since the very beginning in my lab. And I would be illustrating what are the capacities of this technique, and in particular, what are we doing specifically with this technique and why this has been a disruptive uh, advance that has allowed us to do experiments that we could not even dream uh, before. So let me tell you a couple of words about these two researchers. That's the, this is probably, well, without probably, this is the, the first time two women researchers were awarded uh, alone a Nobel Prize. And uh, on the left, Emmanuel Charpentier, she's French. She's now directing an institute, the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, in Germany. She's microbiologist and she's been interested in uh, RNA and in the RNA world. And she started uh, the work in the, in the CRISPR world around 2011. On the right, Jennifer Downer. She's biochemist and she's uh, from the University of California in Berkeley. She's a crystallographer. She's uh, someone that has been resolving the macromolecular structures of many different proteins, including some of the proteins involved in the CRISPR-Cas system. She started working a couple of years before than uh, Emmanuel. And both uh, in 2009, Jennifer started, both Jennifer and Manuel they collaborated only in one uh, occasion. So they decided to collaborate for one single paper that was in June 
2012. And this paper, this seminal and pioneering paper was published in the scientific journal Science. And that's exactly the paper that brought them to the Nobel Prize eight years later in October uh, last year. So as the uh, Swedish Academy of Sciences was uh, highlighting, was uh, Emmanuel and Jennifer were highlighted for the development of a method for genome editing. As you can see in the title of the prize, the, this magic word CRISPR was not mentioned, but everybody understood that they were referring to CRISPR. I would like to highlight the article A method. They don't say the method, they say a method because as you may not know or may know, there have been several attempts over the recent history to develop systems that would be compatible with the genome editing of uh, nucleic acids, normally AD, uh, DNA, but also RNA. So to begin with, in 1995, we, we got to know the first of these proteins that is able to target a given DNA and promote, it, and promote its, uh, its editing. That's, these were the meganucleases, which is a, it's a kind of a restriction enzyme that is recognizing larger sequences, 20 to 40 base pairs, that were discovered in yeast. Six years later, in 2001, it was a totally, uh, totally uh, in vitro protein that was made from different compounds, from different domains. And these were the sing finger nucleases. In this case, the domains of DNA binding from different transcription factors that were used to target a given DNA sequence and that were bound with uh, the, uh, the cutting domain of a restriction of a bacterial restriction enzyme. The same bacterial restriction enzyme was also associated 10 years later with uh, some domains that also recognize DNA from bacteria that are infecting, that are parasiting uh, plants. And these are the talons or the tail nucleases. All these uh, were relying on a protein or different types of proteins recognizing DNA. Well, the revolution came when in 2013, it was uh, clear that the CRISPR-Cas system that was originated in prokaryotics, in bacteria and in archaea, they didn't need a protein for recognizing the DNA sequence. Rather, they were using an RNA sequence as a guide and this RNA sequence was uh, the one that was pairing with our favorite gene. And there was a nuclease that was belonging to the same system, so nothing artifactual. There was nothing in vitro. It was currently an application existing in bacteria that eventually was used. So this was the proposal as it appeared in that uh, seminal paper in June 2012, in summer 2012. And that was the only paper in which these two researchers decided to collaborate. And this paper uh, was uh, suggesting, it was not demonstrating, but it was suggesting that this original CRISPR-Cas system would be compatible with the genome editing of any gene from any living organism. As you can see, it is a binary uh, system. It's composed of a nuclease, an endonuclease, Cas9, it's, uh, it's, of course, cutting DNA in a double strand break. And this uh, nuclease is not cutting everywhere. It's cutting only where this synthetic guide of RNA, this blue molecule, is pairing with our favorite gene. Depending on which nuclease is from which bacteria, they will be cutting in one place or another, and they will be using one guide or one other type of guide. But essentially, it is cutting the DNA somewhere in the genome guided by an RNA molecule. Nine years later, so what we use today in all labs, it is the so-called ribonucleoprotein, this RMPs. What you see now in the slide is absolutely uh, everything is commercial. So the Cas9 on or all the Cas nucleases, these are recombinant. You can purchase it through different vendors. The synthetic guide has been split in two different parts. One variable part, which is called the CRISPR RNA, which is as originally 
the bacteria's use this system. And that's the one that carries the 20 ribonucleotides that pair using Watson and Crick pairment with uh, your favorite gene. And this CRISPR RNA is pairing with the tracer RNA. And this purple uh, small RNA molecule is pairing with the CRISPR RNA and also is binding with the nuclease. So basically the nuclease and the tracer RNA, they are constant for every single experiment. And the only thing you have to vary to target and to promote the addition of different genes is the CRISPR RNA. We uh, owe these uh, systems to the work, the seminal work, 20 years ago started by these microbiologists, Francisco Juan Martínez Mojica, Francis Mojica from the University of Alicante. He was the one to discover these systems, not only in bacteria, but also in archaea. And he was the one to, to first interpret these uh, systems correctly. This is a true defense system, a true immune system, because uh, he was also coining the name CRISPR. CRISPR stands for Cluster Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And these are the repeats that appear in the genome of these bacteria and, and these archaea. And in these repeats, they contain pieces of the viral genomes of different viruses. And whenever a bacteria is carrying a piece of a given viruses, it becomes resistant to the infection to that given virus. And this is why it was a truly immune system. And this is why Francis, among many other researchers, was also postulated for a potential uh, Nobel Prize. So what is happening in the prokaryotes is that this CRISPR-Cas system, they have a biological function. They fight the bacteriophage. They fight the plasmids. They fight any intruding DNA that wants to enter the bacterial cell because these repetitions are normally transcribed and these transcriptions, these small RNAs are pairing with the DNA. And whenever this uh, pairing is occurring, there is a chain, there is a cascade of nucleases, including the Cas9, that eventually is deleting, is uh, digesting the intruding DNA. This is a very effective and very specific, it's a fascinating immune system that has been worked out over the years. And the compound, now we can use these compounds in eukaryotes, and now we can use it through plasmids or through RNAs or through proteins inside, uh, for instance, different viral vectors to promote the addition of cells in culture or animals through mammalian embryos. So this is about 20 years of research from 1993. That was the first paper published by Francis Mojica, where he was describing these uh, archaeas. And the 2013 were the four uh, scientists that are identified at the bottom of this 12 uh, collage were the ones demonstrating the proposal made by these two researchers. So you can see Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Downer are central in this figure because they were the ones proposing six, uh, six months before in June 2012 that this could be used as a genome editing system that was confirmed by, by Feng Zhang and George George in January 2013 and then the others. So basically this is a system that cuts DNA and upon cutting the DNA, we are promoting the repairing of this double strand break. And this double strand break, they have to be repaired because otherwise the next time the cell is dividing, there will be a piece of the chromosome that will be lost because it will not be associated with the centromere. So the cell has monitoring systems that uh, they are constantly inspecting for the double strand breaks. And as soon as they are, they are, they are pitting, they, they need to be fixed. We have at least two different systems for repairing. On the left, the non-homologous end joining in which we are inserting and deleting nucleotides until we generate a microhomology and then we restore the physical continuation, the phys physical continuity of the chromosome. This is normally resulting in the disruption of the gene because we have inserted and removed uh, some letters. So basically, this is one of the first function of this system. Remember, the CRISPR-Cas, the only thing it does is cutting the DNA. But the, 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 the output, could you please uh, switch off the microphone, please? Could you please switch off the microphones? Thank you. So uh, once the double strand, 
once the double strand breaks is produced, this is resulting in a gene disruption. As an alternative repairing system, this is the one governed by homology in which we can use a template with homology left to right to the double strand break. And then we can promote inserting sequence de novo so we can insert a mutation or we can correct the mutation. And this is properly speaking, the gene edition. So CRISPR is everywhere and can be applied to biology, to biomedicine and biotechnology in different species and different circumstances. And basically you can delete, insert, replace, modify, label, basically you name it. So the limit is the imagination of the researcher. The easiest that you can do with CRISPR-Cas is inactivating a gene. So basically, it couldn't be easier. And nowadays, we just have to design a guide against our favorite gene, and then we transfect these CRISPR-Cas tools, and the result is that the gene gets normally inactivated. We can, we can use, instead of using only one CRISPR-Cas system, we can use two that are detecting two neighboring sequences. And uh, see, we, when we use these two different CRISPR-Cas systems, we are promoting the deletion or whatever is in between. And this is one of the first applications that we do in, um, in my lab. We have been interested for many years in the non-coding genome. Remember that our genome, 100% of our genome, only 2% of the genome is the one that contains the genes. We have only 20,000 genes and these occupy not much, it's about 2%. So what is in the 98% uh, rest of the genome? Well, we have a number of repetitive elements. We have mobile elements, but we have regulatory elements as we have learned through international consortia such as the ENCODE. So we have been um, investigating well, how these regulatory elements, the switches that tell the genes to be activated or be inactivated were relevant for the gene expression. This is one experimental gene that we have in the lab. This is the gene called tyrosinase. Tyrosinase is encoding an enzyme that is uh, on the basis of the, of the synthesis of the pigment, of the melanin. So tyrosinase is an oxidase, is oxidating an amino acid, uh, the tyrosine, and is converting tyrosine into different intermediates, and eventually this is converted into melanin. So tyrosinase is only expressed in cells of the pigment cells of the body, and has different uh, regulatory elements that for 20 years we could not investigate because these uh, colored balls, these red and these purple balls, these different elements, we could not investigate because they were in the middle of repetitive sequences and that was preventing us from trying to understand the role. But now we can use CRISPR-Cas because we can promote a double strand break left and right of a given regulatory element. And if we, when we do so, we can promote the excision of that uh, piece of DNA that contains the regulatory element and we can produce a cell or we can produce an animal that doesn't carry these regulatory elements. So we can ask the biological question, what is the relevance of this regulatory element? This is what we have done in several occasions. These were among the first animals that we investigated. Remember, these are genes associated with pigmentation. We're not touching the gene itself. We are touching regulatory elements that are far away from the gene. And when we remove this regulatory element, as you can see, you don't have to be an expert in the field to realize that this, that this mouse is gray. And this mouse is gray because we have injected injected when it was embryo, this CRISPR-Cas systems, and this has been promoting the deletion of the regulatory element. And this is a very efficient system because this is only not only working in the heterozygous animals with one copy, but is working in the two copies of the gene that normally we have for every single gene. This is something that is robustly occurring. So we can generate multiple different lines with different deletions. We can assemble, we can, uh, we can investigate and we can see what do they have, what do they miss in common and the sequence they lack in common is pointing to where in the genome we have these uh, regulatory elements. And this is 
why genetic analysis is now possible with mice, something that was not possible before. And this is what we have done with uh, different regulatory elements in the tyrosinase and other genes. What else we can do with uh, CRISPR-Cas? We can promote inversions that also are associated with congenital rare disease. We can promote duplications. Sometimes the repairing system is making mistakes and these mistakes can result in duplications. Or we can make something very subtle, which is uh, absolutely relevant for what we do, because sometimes we want to investigate. We are working with uh, patients with a rare disease, as uh, you will learn in a minute, with a rare disease called albinism, and we want to we want to understand why different persons with different mutations have the same phenotype. And uh, this is what we can promote with the CRISPR-Cas system in which we can promote cutting and with a template that is carrying the mutations, we, we can trigger that this uh, template with the mutation is used to repair the double strand break. So we are introducing the double strand break exactly in the expected position. And this has led to something that's, uh, that has changed the way we do experiments nowadays in the lab. And we are now creating what we call avatar CRISPR mice. Avatar as this 2009 science scientific scientific uh, uh, science fiction movie from James Cameron, in which this blue beast they were associated each one of them with a human being. So this is the metaphor that I'm using. Now I can diagnose. I can genetically diagnose a given person with a rare disease, and I can reproduce exactly the same mutation in the homologous gene, in the mouse genome, using mice, and not any given mutation, but exactly the same mutation that is occurring in that person. And the resulting mice, it's a mouse that is called an avatar. So we are applying this into albinis. Albinis is a rare disease that is, even though it's it's normally seen as a problem with pigmentation. This is a secondary issue. The primary issue, it's a, it's a bit, there are people, they are visually handicapped. They have a reduced visual acuity. They are legally blind in many countries. They have a neurological symptoms such as this nystagmus. Their eyes are moving all the time. And this is caused by mutations in many different uh, genes. This is, for instance, one of the genes, tyrosinase. Tyrosinase, when this is mutated, is causing this person that has no pigment at all in the skin, in the hair, or in the eyes. And these are persons that have a, a very severe uh, poor deficiency, visual deficiency, because they don't have phobia, they don't have the central retina, and they don't have uh, this uh, three-dimensional uh, vision. So they don't... Uh, they don't easily find objects in the space because they lack this sharing of these uh, neuronal connections that is normally occurring between mm, the, the two eyes. Genetically speaking, we have at the moment 22 genes that are associated with mutations causing albinism. So this is a very complex uh, uh, rare disease or very complex uh, congenital disease. And basically all these different mutations can now be studied in, in animals, in mice. This is one of the first that we produce in the lab. This is Patty. This is a person uh, that we diagnose in the lab. She's a person with albinism. In uh, contrast to the person that I showed before, she has a type of albinism that is called oculocutaneous type 4 that is associated with mutations to the gene SLC45A2. And all what uh, she has is a deletion of a single letter. It's a cytosine, it's a C that is missing in a particular coordinate of that particular gene. And of course, when you remove a letter, you alter the codons, you alter the translation of that given gene, resulting in a non-functional protein. So the mouse that is shown in the upper right position, it's exactly an avatar for a party because the mouse is carrying exactly the same mutation in the same gene and is missing exactly the same C. And this is something very relevant that we didn't have before because now we can validate treatments. So we can 
check uh, whether there will be a report a reproposal of um, of uh, some drugs some treatments that have been originally designed for treating other diseases but might be useful for treating halvinis and before running risk with human beings we can investigate whether they could be safe or they could be efficient for treating not albinism in general, but treating that particular mutations, that particular gene being affected. So this is uh, an advantage, uh, advance that we have uh, now accomplished using the CRISPR-Cas for these preclinical uh, studies. What else we can do? We can do knock-ins. We can insert uh, entire pieces into a gene so we can change the fate and the function of a gene. And we can even remove the... Um, the capacity of these nucleases for cutting DNA. And this is something that Jennifer Downer awarded the Nobel Prize, was investigating from the very beginning from 2013 in, in collaboration with other researchers. So this Cas9, it's able to cut the two different strands of the DNA because it has two different domains. So we can mutate these domains and we can generate a that Cas9, this D Cas9, that it's no longer cutting. And what is the good uh, opportunity for this dead Cas9? Well, the dead Cas9 is not cutting, but is positioning, is locating whatever we want somewhere in the genome. Because now we can associate that dead Cas9 with an effector domain, and we can transform these uh, neutral nucleases into a epigenetic tool, and we can operate and we can trigger the activation or the inactivation of a gene. So if we associate with a domain that is promoting transcription, now we will be activating a gene. If we are associating with a repressing domain, we will be inactivating a gene. And so this has been published last week in this new variants, CRISPR, the so-called CRISPR on and CRISPR off that are promoting the hypermethylation of a gene. And this is through CRISPR off. And when we use crispr off, we can silence specifically a gene. You know that some diseases are caused due to misexpression of a given of a, of a given gene. And then we we can also reactivate this uh, system. We can reactivate this system by using the crispr on, and the crispr on will be removing these methylations and will be reactivating the gene. So this is um, something that has been uh, already implemented in different variants. So as you can see, these are extraordinarily amenable tools that uh, nonetheless, they have limitations and we need to know these limitations. First, these guides, they can uh, target similar genes, and this is the so-called off-target effects, because we want to target one gene, but we may en end up targeting another gene, and this is something we need to take into account. This is something potentially dangerous, and this is something we can reduce to the limit, because there have been many different bioinformatic tools that help us designing the guides, RNAs, to drive the CRISPR-Cas system to a given a different place in, in the genome. The real problem that we have is the on-target effects. So the on-target effects is associated with mosaicism. And the mosaicism is because normally we would assume that the repairing will be uh, normally done through this right uh, pathway that is governed by homology. But this is not happening by the fall, and this is only happening in those cells that are actively dividing. And for the majority of the cells, what is occurring is that uh, the non-homologous enjoining, it's, uh, it's the one that is progressing, and this is progressing through insertions and deletions, and this is generating a number of different alleles. So it's generating a number of genetic noise. Genetic noise that can be seen, this is the result of an experiment in mice using CRISPR-Cas. When we let the system to repair, each one of these lines is a different mouse. And as you can see, they have different mutations and different repairings, among which we have the one we wanted, but this is just one, and the rest we are not interested. So this is something 
that is creating troubles. And this is the real problem for that is limiting the use of this CRISPR-Cas universally in the clinics with some exceptions, as you can see. Well, the origin of this problem, when we are inserting this into a one cell embryo, these tools, they are not vanishing, they stay while the embryo is dividing. And so we get to this uh, eight cell stage and this eight cell stage, they have two alleles for, for every gene. So we have 16 possible alleles that can be repaired. And if they will be repaired, they will be repaired differently. So this is what we're living with. And this is what, uh, this is the problem we're facing when we do the experiment with mice. All the mice that are born after CRISPR-Cas, they carry different mutations. They are mosaics and, and including one, the mutation that is associated with the mutation that we wanted. We, we, have, to, we have to highlight this mouse and do the corresponding process until we can uh, basically select this uh, mouse for line. This is of course something, and we will be discarding the rest. This is something that we're doing with mice, but we cannot do this with uh, human beings, as you can see, ethically unacceptable. What else we can do to overcome these limitations? Well, we can uh, use the dead Cas9 with a deaminase chemical activity. And this deaminase is being promoted by David Liu that is chemically changing a cytosine into a timidine or adenosine into a guanine directly without cutting the DNA. And this is already being used in different models of let's say this is a congenital disease, tyrosinemia, or most recently beginning of this year in a model of uh, progeria, this uh, accelerated uh, aging that is affecting both mice and uh, human beings. And in which case we can do this base editing to remove the mutation. There is a new modification, which is associating this Nikase. And Nikase is a, is a Cas9 that is only cutting in one strand that is associated with reverse transcriptase. And basically this is a long guide that is driving the extension of the opposite DNA strand in which we can fix the mutation to occur or the correction to occur. This is already being investigated in uh, mice, for instance, and the prime editing, as that's the name, the quality gene editing, as you can see, maybe is not as efficient as the standard gene editing, but in contrast to the standard gene editing is not producing mosaicists. So this is a good, this is good news. And this is something that will need to be investigated. So what is the major function and major use of CRISPR-Cas besides the biotechnological and biological uses, which is of course uh, gene therapy. And in gene therapy, it's about uh, doing the opposite. We know about a mutation in a gene and we want to correct this mutation. And when we correct this mutation, we have to cut very near to the mutation and with a template. And once the template is being uh, used for repairing this double cut, then we can be sure that the gene has been corrected. As you know, there are legal and illegal ways of doing gene therapy. The legal way in Spain and in other countries is germline. We cannot alter the gene above the, the sense, but we can do definitely uh, ex vivo and in vivo somatic gene therapy. As you probably recall in November, 2018, this uh, Chinese scientist, He Jiankui, he was editing human embryos, he was implanting, and that was resulting in the birth of three uh, little girls that had the genome edited. These are the three first human beings. This experiment was absolutely irresponsible because the same alterations that I see in mice that would be occurring in human beings. He was, intent, uh, he was attempting to inactivate the gene encoding the doorway that is using the human Im immunodeficiency virus causing AIDS to access into lymphocytes. He was not able to do this and he was uh, condemned to jail for three years and paying a fine and inhabilitated in, 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 in for life. We should not be 
using these techniques for gemline editing because there are still many different rearrangements and problems associated with the chromosome as we have been witnessing in the literature. So therefore the therapeutic use of CRISPR in human embryos is illegal in most countries and necessary because we have alternative methods and absolutely unwise and unethical. So what about somatic gene, ethic, gene therapy? Well, we have two different types in vivo and ex vivo. In vivo, we can deliver directly the CRISPR-Cas tools into the, into the person. Ex vivo, we can extract cells and we can edit the cells in the lab and then we return the cells once they are edited and correctly edited into the, into the patient. The very first experiment in gene therapy that were published in January 2016, so five years ago, and they were done in mice that were animal models of a terrible disease, which is the, uh, this uh, muscular dystrophy, Duchenne muscular dystrophy that is affecting also humans, that is normally causing the, the death early in the 30s or the 40s normally. So we have a mouse that doesn't have this dystrophy. This is the MDX mouse. Once we are using CRISPR-Cas to remove the exon that carries the mutation, we are producing a resulting smaller dystrophy protein that maybe is uh, repairing in maybe 10, 15% of the mus muscular fib fibers, but this is enough to have a therapeutic gain. So today you might argue or you might question how many clinical trials are using CRISPR already, are exploring the use of CRISPR. Well, you can tell, I can tell you that there are more than 4,500 clinical trials on gene therapy of various different sorts. Only 46 out of them are dealing with CRISPR and most of them are ex vivo. The exception being, for instance, this uh, proposal that was launched in the end of 2018, for treating this uh, degenerative, uh, retinal degenerative disease, Levers congenital amaurosis type 10, in which we can inject intraocularly and subretinally, hoping that we will be removing the mutation in the affected gene. Also, as we learned exactly one year ago, the CRISPR is being used ex vivo for trying to pro provide some therapeutic solutions for refractory cancers cancers that they cannot be treated with uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy, such as melanoma, sarcoma, or myeloma. These are the most aggressive cancers. We can obtain from patients these T-lymphocytes, and these T-lymphocytes, they can be used with CRISPR. We can inactivate the PD-1 gene. This is a negative regulator of the immune system. So it means when we remove the PD-1, the immune system will be stronger, and we can replace the T cell receptor with a specific uh, chimeric antigen receptor. You probably heard about the concept, the CAR T cells. This is being done also here in Madrid in, in the Hospital La Paz and the 12 de Octubre and Gregorio Marañón. They are already using this technique because these are these lymphocytes. Once they have been treated with CRISPR, they can be actively uh, finding and killing these tumoral cells. This is, uh, I think this is good news for the future. And this is one of the, uh, the positive applications of CRISPR-Cas. Another success that, has, that is worth mentioning is for treating this blood uh, severe disease, sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. They share in common these are mutated the beta globin chain of the hemoglobin that is transporting oxygen to our cells. Beta globin can be substituted by the fetal globin that we have, the gamma globin. Normally, the gamma globin is not expressed in the adulthood, but it's not expressed because it is repressed. But if we are killing the repressor, if we are using CRISPR-Cas to remove the repressor, then we will awake we will reactivate the gamma globin and this gamma globin will be able to substitute the mutated beta globin. And this is a, another very talented idea that was started uh, one and a half years ago and that has already been causing uh, very good uh, successes. She is Victoria Gray. She's the first patient ever treated with CRISPR. She was a patient with sickle cell anemia. She was undergoing uh, maybe once or twice a week uh, a blood transfusion. So this is altering 
their quality of life. But now, since she was treated, the beta globin, which is these green bars, has been substituted by the gamma globin, which is these blue bars. So she is no longer needing these blood uh, transfusions. This normally we're using viral, uh, viral vectors, adeno associated, for transmit these CRISPR Cas tools into the cells of these patients. But this is something that might be of your interest because this is probably closer to your interest, to your research interest. Now, this is explored since October last year by this company, Intelia, that is exploring treating this uh, rare disease. This is the transferritin amyloidosis congenital. This is a rare disease using nanotechnology, using nanoparticles, where these nanoparticles are associated with the CRISPR-Cas, with these ribonucleoproteins that are composed of the nuclease with the corresponding guide RNA and the corresponding template, if there is a need for a template. And eventually, this is uh, delivered through systemic, through the blood system, and eventually is reaching the, the cells. So let me finish in this uh, couple of minutes that I have to finish up this uh, seminar before I will be happy to accept your questions. Well, CRISPR tools are absolutely adaptable and they have been instrumental for many different applications. And of course, the question was, is it possible to use CRISPR-Cas in order to use it some way, one way or another for investigating this COVID-19 pandemics? Well, the answer is yes, because all what I've been telling you so far is the so-called CRISPR 1.0 system. The CRISPR 1.0 is the one that is using nucleases that with the help of a guide RNA, a targeting and, and DNA, targeting a gene and promoting the substitution of a given nucleotide or several nucleotides and resulting in the correction of the protein. So what is the CRISPR 2.0? Well, the CRISPR 2.0, it's uh, we know of uh, CRISPR 2.0 since 2017, four years ago in which we discover new nucleases that are not targeting DNA, but RNA. So the mutation is left untouched in the DNA. So this has also ethical consequences because we are not altering the genome of the patients, but here we were targeting the RNA and we can promote the substitution of the gene. So there were the first uh, nucleases that were discovered by Feng Zhang in 2017. Among them was the Cas13A. This is equivalent to the Cas9, but has a different activity. In contrast to Cas9, that is cutting double-strand DNA, Cas13A is cutting RNA. It's not cutting RNA randomly, it's cutting only when the guide RNA is pairing with the corresponding RNA. But once this is happening, somehow this Cas13A uh, turns crazy. It loses the specificity and it will cut everything in the mixture, everything in the ASA2. And this was something that was uh, discovered by Feng Zhang and he decided to convert this apparently unexpected activity into opportunity for diagnostics because he was spiking this uh, reaction with a very small RNA molecule that has a fluorescent marker in one end and a quencher in the other end. The quencher is so close to the fluorescent marker that there is no fluorescent light being emitted. But once you, the Cas13A is finding its coconut sequence, the complementary sequence, this Cas13A will cut everything, including this reporter RNA, and it will release the, fluores the fluorescence, and then we will see the light. And this light, it will be a way of diagnosing the presence of that RNA. Of course, as you know, the genome of uh, the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA. So immediately when the pandemics occur, Feng Zhang and many, or many other researchers started using these CRISPR uh, applied uh, systems for diagnose the presence of this virus without the need of using the PCR. PCR is a very robust method, but as you know, PCR is a very old method. We know about the polymerase chain reaction since more than 40 years, 
and it requires very sophisticated equipment. It requires some time, at least three, four hours. And normally it requires expertise and it's very easy to contaminate the samples. Now we have the CRISPR and in a few minutes, we can see a fluorescent light coming in and the fluorescent light will be detecting and will be informing the presence of the coronavirus. There have been many different varied varieties of the endoxin system. And the last one I wanted to tell you is being proposed by Jennifer Downa. And this was published uh, uh, two months after receiving her Nobel uh, Prize. And Jennifer Downa, together with many other collaborators, was uh, converting this uh, Cas13A system for diagnosing SARS-CoV-2. And the fluorescence, uh, look at this, and this was a very talented uh, movement. She was able to, de to devise a method that the fluorescence, you don't have to see the fluorescence with a sophisticated equipment. You can use the camera of your iPhone, of your cell phone. So basically you can use this and this is already being explored. There is a pattern and there are systems that are being explored and investigated in the US. This is very recent, as you see, December, 2020. And last but not least, there are different CAS-13s, not only CAS-13A, but also CAS-13D that have uh, the capacity not to lose this specificity. So if we have, a CRISPR-Cas system that can cut a given RNA, and we know that the genome of our coronavirus is an RNA, we can, uh, we can use a CRISPR-Cas based on Cas13D to deliver this CRISPR-Cas system into a cell that is being infected by the coronavirus. And basically we will be promoting the digestion of the genome of the coronavirus, and then we will be inhibiting its replication. So we will be using this CRISPR as an antiviral agent. And so this is something that has already been explored in cells and in, in animal models. So let me finish by just acknowledging again this extraordinary work and extraordinary suggestion made by Manuel Charpentier and Jennifer Downer. They were the ones proposing that we can use this immune system from bacteria in order to genome edit it any gene from any living organism. And uh, let me also remind you that everything was possible also because some 28 years ago, this man, this uh, microbiologist, Francis Mojica, was, uh, was documenting this CRISPR-Cas system in these archaeas that are living in the cell ponds of Santa Paula in Alicante. So I finish now in time with the 45 minutes allocated for this talk, but just acknowledging the people in my group and acknowledging the different institutions that are providing some funds for us to do research. And without uh, anything else to say, I will be happy to respond to answer any question that you may have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Luis. And uh, now it's time for question. Uh, uh, this, uh, you can unmute. I see your... I have the chat window open. So if there is someone yeah. type willing to type something or you can use the microphone, whatever you want. Thank you, Luis, for this exciting speech about this CRISPR uh, technology and the application. Uh, I would like to ask you about the the risk of this CRISPR-Cas9 in in vivo in gene therapy. There are uh, many risks uh, in, for the use of that. Uh, is because of that they use the, the XTEL technology? Well, basically, the, uh, the risk associated with the use of CRISPR-Cas are of two kinds. First, we can target genes that we are not interested to change. Mm -hmm. and this is the off-target. So this is something that we need to be very aware and we need to be very careful. But this is not something to worry much because we can now use uh, CAS nucleases that are more specific and we can use bioinformatic designs that are producing guide RNAs that are extremely specific. What is something to worry about is these mosaic effects. So you are not only producing one single output, but you're producing a family of, of outputs. 
And sometimes you are producing an, an, an gene edited allele that is even more dangerous than the one you wanted to correct. And so this is something you shouldn't be doing, right? So, and this is why there are these alternatives that I highlighted that I just mentioned, this base editing or the prime editing that have almost no mosaic effects, have no on-target effects that probably in the long run will be the ones that will be routinely used in clinics. At the moment in clinics, as you probably have seen, most of the applications with a couple of exceptions, most of the applications are ex vivo. Ex vivo means you extract cells from the patient and in the lab, we do what we have to do to edit the gene. And once we know that this has been correctly done, we can transfer back the cells edited to the patient. So this is safe. Uh, but this is not something that we can apply for everything. There are diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, neuromuscular diseases, metabolic diseases that we cannot use blood cells. We cannot use skin cells. We need to use the corresponding cells and we need to target the cells such as when we are targeting into the eye and we need to target the cells. And there we have a risk. There's always this ethical evaluation between benefits and risk and we have to maximize the benefits and minimize the risk. And this is actually where we are in the clinic applications of these techniques. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the, to answer the, the question. All uh, right. Any more question? When? There is a question from Maria Alonso. Mm -hmm. Maria says, thanks for this interesting seminar. Could you provide some more details on the investigation performed here in Spain about the use of this method 1.0 and 2.0 in oncology and to treat the present COVID-19? Well, with pleasure, Maria. Uh, let's say here in, um, here in Spain, here in Madrid, we have a team uh, that is directed by Juan Bueren and uh, Paula Rio, and they're working at the CMAT at the Moncloa campus, and they apply in CRISPR-Cas for treating a congenital severe disease, which is Fan uh, Fanconi anemia. It's a type of, uh, it's a rare disease that is causing pediatric cancers that is normally fatal for the kids that are associated. And they are extracting cells from the kid and they are using CRISPR-Cas for correcting the gene and bringing the edited cells back to the kids. And they have already been doing some preliminary analysis with standard gene therapy technology. And now they are planning to use the CRISPR-Cas. So this is already ongoing. For instance, for oncology also in the, in the uh, Hospital La Paz here in Madrid, there is uh, an oncologist, a pediatric oncologist, Antonio uh, uh, Perez Martinez, that is the chief of uh, pediatric oncology. And he is applying CRISPR-Cas for producing CAR T cells. These are these uh, customized cells that are used for treating, for instance, myeloma, multiple myeloma that is affecting these kids. And normally it wasn't treatable. And most of these kids, they were dying. Now you can say 30, 40, 50% of them. This is already a great achievement. Regarding 2.0, we, we are involved together with, uh, we are not biologists, we are geneticists. So we can uh, provide uh, in a multidisciplinary team, we can provide our expertise in CRISPR together with uh, Dolores Rodriguez, which is a biologist here at the CMB, and together with Miguel Angel Moreno Mateos at the CABD in Seville, in which we are collaborating to uh, prepare a ribonucleoprotein based on caster TD that we could use first in cells, later in animal models, and eventually in clinical trials in human beings to treat people that is infected. Remember the vaccines are for people for preventing the infection of the COVID-19, but we want to develop antiviral system, not a vaccine, but a treatment for those people that have already the virus inside their cells in which this CRISPR-Cas 2.0 will be directed directly against the genome of this coronavirus. And this is a uh, currently ongoing project that is being funded by the platform of uh, global health of the, our institution of the CSIC. And we are very optimist and hopefully we will be obtaining the expected results soon. 
Okay, thank you. We expect we we want to to have yes, this. I mean, I think we all should do all what we can to fight this uh, pandemic. As you can see, we I never work with fighters, but uh, I can combine my genetic expertise with the expertise of other people that they know how to work with viruses and with other people that they know how to use these uh, CRISPR 2.0 molecules, such as these colleagues in Seville. So if we join, we make a collaborative project and uh, we can progress more rapidly and more, hopefully, more successfully. Mm -hmm. There is a, a new question. Yeah, there is a there is an unknown person. He's asking how long a CRISPR system can be functionally active in vivo experiments. It's somehow eliminated. Well, I'm insisting all the time that uh, the current use of the CRISPR-Cas system is based in RMPs. RMPs are ribbon nucleoproteins. So this is there is no nucleic acid. Uh, there is no DNA. So it's a protein associated with a guide that will be cutting a number of times the DNA and eventually this protein will be eliminated by the ubiquitin system, by the proteasome system in the cell. So this is, there, is, there is no problem for anticipating long-term effects of the CRISPR system. The problem is the delivery. The problem is how to get enough amounts of these RMPs in the target cells in the less time possible so that they can peak in their activity in a given moment in time and in a given place in space in the body so that we can target the cells. The delivery, this is actually most of the, uh, most of the challenges that are trying to be resolved. And this is web, for instance, where the material sciences can be of help because uh, we have been using traditionally viral vectors such as adeno-associated or adenoviruses. But as you know, they, are, they can be used, but with some disadvantages and limitations. And I guess the future is nanoparticles. We need new materials. We need particles that they can be associated with RMPs, and they also can be targeted and associated with peptides that can be targeted to our desired cell so that we can deliver this CRISPR-Cas only in the cells that have been infected. For instance, maybe using the receptor, the same receptor that is using the viruses to enter the cell. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. These were all very interesting questions. So I thank you for this because these are complementary to what I've been telling. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems there is no more questions at the moment. Okay, if, if there is no more question, uh, we would like to thank again uh, Luis for his exciting speech about this uh, technology. And we hope this uh, technology give good results for the treatment of several diseases and also for this pandemic. Uh, COVID-19. Thank, thank you, Conchi, for this invitation, and I hope you enjoy this seminar. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.